Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. The race to be the first to put a man into space was a defining moment in the Cold War. Well, the story of the Mercury 7 has been told and retold by Tom Wolfe and in various movies and TV series, the other side has not been covered as in-depthly. The story of how Yuri Gagarin became the first man in space has always been shrouded in mystery and propaganda. So I'm delighted that this week I'm joined by documentary filmmaker and author Stephen Walker, whose new book, Beyond, delves into what gave the Soviet space program the right stuff to be the first to put a man into space. Beyond covers a fascinating level of detail, but in a very compressed timeline of only a few months. So to delve into this book, which is one of my favorite nonfiction books of the last couple of years, I had to start by asking Stephen where he started. What was that entry point for the research that became Beyond? Well, it's interesting because I had, I've always been fascinated by space, you know? I mean, I'm of the generation that grew up as a tiny little boy, um, the end of the 1960s. I can just actually remember watching Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Actually, it's the, uh, the very first moment that that Apollo landed on the moon. I was sitting with my grandfather, I remember, who was born in 1893, can you believe this? Wow. And was a first World War pilot. And there he was, and there I was, and we were watching on a black and white TV. I was tiny, but I do definitely remember that moment um, of the first walk on the moon. And I can remember being very disappointed because it was so fuzzy, the black and white image, I couldn't work out <laughs> what on earth was going. Uh, but I could actually read the subtitles because they had all the subtitles of the, you know, when people were talking. And it was some, um, and I could sense that, that excitement, even as a tiny boy. I remember my grandfather was totally amazed that, I mean, he was born before the Wright brothers and there he was watching, you know, Apollo 11. It's incredible. So I suppose I'd always been brought up with all of this anyway, and then I kind of left it in the background. And I also, I've always been fascinated by flight. I have a private pilot's license. I've got years and years to go and I fly little planes and terrify friends doing it. And so the whole business about kind of leaving the planet or leaving certainly the crown had always kind of excited me. Anyway, somewhere back in, I can't remember it was, about 2013, 2014, I was actually in a secondhand bookstore somewhere in London. I think it was literally in Charing Cross actually and on Charing Cross Road. And I found this extraordinary book written by a guy called Vladimir Suvorov, who's a character in my book. And this guy was a cinematographer. He was a filmmaker, one of the best filmmakers actually in Russia at the time. And he was asked to volunteer in 1957, I think it was, to document, to record on film, the nascent top secret Soviet space program. And he wasn't even allowed to tell his family about what he was doing. And he entered a world that, as he described somewhere, is science fiction. I mean, he entered this extraordinary world where there were kind of rockets and satellites and plans to put human beings into space and go on to the moon and onto Mars. And this is all in the late 1950s. And going to these incredible facilities like Baikonur, obviously in Soviet, as it was then, Kazakhstan, which is the rocket launch site, the missile site at the time and other of these facilities that are building the spaceships and the rockets. And he got immersed in that world. And he was allowed to keep a diary. Incredibly, he was allowed to keep a diary, which was monitored by the KGB at the time. He had to hand the diary back every evening and it was put onto lock and key. And the next morning he was given it back and was able to write. And this book that I came across was an English translation of a part of the diary. And I read it fascinated as a filmmaker. I am a filmmaker. And I saw this and I thought, my God, maybe we can access. It must exist somewhere. All the original raw material, the rushes, if you like, of this material that was shot, which apparently was shot in 35 millimeter in color at the time. So the quality would up res onto a big screen. So I thought, wow, let's do. We've always had this stuff about Apollo and all these big sort of movies, documentary films with incredible footage about Saturn V and so on. Let's go back to the first before the first, if you like, uh, the first man in space. So I pitched the idea. Sorry, because mm -hmm. all the 
all the original sort of Mercury 7 NASA stuff, that's 16 mil, isn't it? That sort of handheld. 16 millimeter. Yeah. Yeah, there is a little bit of 35 millimeter. That's really right. But it's actually mostly 16 millimeter. And it's, although it's quite a lot of it is disorganized, a lot of it is very well organized as well. And I've, I've seen a lot of that material. I've seen rushes in that material. When I was preparing for this, I came across some really quite amazing stuff. But the Soviet side, there's, you only ever see the same 10 images over and over again that were mostly excerpts from a movie that was released, a documentary movie that was released after Yuri Gagarin actually went into space as a kind of propaganda coup for the Soviets. That's what happened. But where was this original stuff and could it be found? So cut a long story short, I pitched it to a company called Working Title. They actually picked it up. They gave me development money. I went out to Russia three or four times and I went and interviewed some of the last surviving cosmonauts from that period, as well as engineers and goodness knows what. I mean, I got drunk on vodka and all kinds of stuff and sat in weird little, very Soviet style apartments. One guy I remember showed me his, it was extraordinary. He was an engineer who'd worked on the R7 rocket that took Yuri Gagarin into space. And I can remember he made a model version of it. I've got a photograph somewhere entirely out of um, Ferrero Rocher suite. Kind of, it's incredible, sweet package, <laughs> and 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 it was brilliant. I mean, it was just a, it was enormous, and it was sitting in its dominating his apartment in St. Petersburg, and it was just. So I met these extraordinary people who'd been right in the vanguard of all of that at the time, and I filmed them in high definition, so cinema quality with a very very good cinematographer, and did these incredible interviews, and we started looking for the footage, and some of the footage we found, but most of the footage we couldn't find. And we wonder whether it was, it would have been destroyed. Is that likely? Whether it was just very disorganized, whether there was some issue politically, it was getting harder and harder to access stuff. We were getting less and less response from key players in that world in Russia who didn't, I think, like the idea of a Brit funded by a Hollywood movie company, essentially Universal Studios, making a film about their national icon, their great hero, the great moment, you know, when Russia, Trump, the West, Trump, America. And, and so it became harder and it got to a point where it became impossible and we shelved the project. And I had all of this material, all these incredible interviews. Some of the people I'd interviewed had actually died since I'd interviewed them, sadly. And I thought, I've got to do something with this. So I took it to my literary editor and said, look, what about a book? That was then pitched to my publishers at HarperCollins who picked it up here and in the United States and the rest is history. I went on and I wrote the book through lockdown at a crazy speed. Um, and that's the book you've got about beyond. Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to get this in early. It's fantastic. It is a really, really good read. And now I'm really annoyed that the movie didn't happen. <laughs> well, so actually I did, I did shoot a trailer, which is, I know it's more, not a trailer, it's actually called a taster. And it's about 35 minutes long. And it was amazing because I managed to go into a fantastic uh, dubbing theatre. Absolutely unbelievable. That's where they put all the sound together, the sound mix. And we had, a, it was enormous. Um, and we had weeks of people actually working on this stuff. And we played it on on big screens uh, to executives from various, and it, it is terribly exciting because you're, you're there, you know, I mean, to put that, to put that rocket launch in surround sound effectively mm -hmm. on a screen that is enormous, like the Odeon Leicester Square style, if that means anything to some people, you know, absolutely oh. enormous. You know, it really was terribly, terribly exciting and terribly frustrating because we, you know, we were that close. But, but I think what this is really about is how Russia, for understandable reasons, I'm sure, have appropriated this story. This is their story. This is their moment, if you like. And it's become sort of symbolic in all sorts of ways. And in a way is even today part of the story of the difference between that world and this world, you know, East and West, Russia and America, whatever. And there was that sense of trespass, the sort of, can they trust a Brit to do mm. this story the way they would want to, you know? Actually, all I was trying to do was tell the story. I'm not interested in, in representing a political point of view. I just want to tell a great story. And that's what I tried to do. So. It turned into a book and it was a great book to write. It was really exciting to write. And you know, who knows, maybe one day we'll get that footage as well and there'll be a book of the documentary yeah, as, as well together. But at the moment there's a book. I, yeah, I just think that that sort of, because uh, Todd Douglas Miller did the, the Apollo 11 film with all the 70 yeah. millimeters, which was fascinating. Having this as a sort of 
juxtaposition of the two would would be fantastic. It would be fantastic, yeah, yeah. And that was seventy, which which really does work actually in four K very very well, or even higher. Whereas thirty five, but the thirty five was pretty good. They had these amazing cameras. I actually interviewed one of the cameramen, and he's now also unfortunately dead. I interviewed him in Moscow. And he showed me his camera. It was a beautiful triple turreted, absolutely fabulous camera, quite heavy actually. And it was incredible to think that this was the camera that kind of filmed people like Yuri Gagarin and all these people and all of these places. That was it. This was the camera that he had with him when he shot this material. So it it was a it was touching that past. That that must have been remarkable. Well, let, let's let's get into some of the other aspects of, of the research because you got to chat to some fantastic people including elena gagarin yuri's daughter I, I wanted to know what it was like meeting meeting her because I, i've sort of seen little very short clips of interviews with her as well but for getting to spend that time with her must have been quite a treasure well it actually started when i was still doing the film research and i i don't know if you remember but there was some kind of unveiling god i'm I'm going to say something embarrassing so I'll probably, I'm sure many of your listeners will come back and say he's got it all wrong but there was an unveiling at Greenwich in the observatory of a statue dedicated a statue of Yuri Gagarin to, to memorializing essentially his flight in 1961 and that statue was um, unveiled and, and Elena Gagarin was actually there so I I, I, this is right at the beginning of my research. I went there and there she was. And she was kind of a celebrity there, of course. And all these people were surrounding her and there were these journalists. It was actually quite a big event in its own way. And I just went up to her. Actually, I went up to her daughter, Katerina, Katya, who was delightful. And I explained who I was. I was all kind of terribly enthusiastic. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to make this film at that point. Could she, could she introduce me to her mother? And so she did. And we actually struck up a friendship and we talked and she said, come and talk to me again. And she gave me a time where I could reach her. I think she was still in London for a few days. I think we met after that. We had lunch together. Katya, the daughter, was there as well. And step by step, we started to build a relationship. You know, she's a very powerful woman in Russia. Uh, she runs the Kremlin Museum. Um, she, you know, the father's a big cheese obviously she's a big cheese in many ways as well and one has to kind of treat her carefully you know but I think there was an affection there and I think she really liked so she said she liked my enthusiasm for the project and I was very dogged I, I just did not give up I was absolutely determined to get this thing together and I think she responded quite well to that and Katya um, was also you know very very kind of helpful and actually really wonderful the, the person i really wanted to get to was valentina gagarin gagarin's wife who was still living in their star city apartment star city is the cosmonaut training center still is today obviously just outside moscow and she lived in this apartment there which had not apparently been changed at all one shred nothing since she was there with yuri gagarin in the 1960s before gagarin's death in 1968 and i mean literally everything was exactly so she lived there with a with a pet parrot that had been given to her by Castro uh, of Cuba. <laughs> and, and she had this parrot who in fact outlived her. And she was a very, very shy, almost I think pathologically shy woman, Gagarin's wife. I mean, you can imagine he was plunged into, he became the most famous man on the planet in 1961. I mean, he really was. And his wife was the shyest person on the planet. I mean, it was an absolute nightmare for her to be thrust into that limelight as she was. And she kind of avoided everybody or anything to do with the press or media or any kind of exposure whatsoever. I tried, I tried, I tried, and I tried to get to speak to her. And I was, I was in, intrigued and seduced by the idea that there were apparently in this apartment boxes of private material relating to Yuri Gagarin. There are photographs, cine film, eight millimeter cine film was shot by him and of, of him by his friends and family, you know, documents, papers, I mean, all kinds of stuff, which of course I was desperate to get my hands on. And I never was able to do so. She, she just didn't want to talk to, I mean, I tried and I tried and then unfortunately she passed away while I was writing the book. And so my opportunity to meet the wife of the world's first human in space was was irretrievably lost um and i never got my hands on that material not because there's any issues or problems but because by that time the book had, it was kind of basically finished in fact and it i think most of it was 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 family mementos and a lot of it is post 1961 my understanding mm -hmm. anyway 
what a what a treasure trove that would have been just just mm-hmm. to, to get that i don't want to say color but that, that emotional side of, of someone who you know, yeah we we feel we know you know in, in, in gagarin because he's so so famous um but we don't really know no that side of him in that relationship and we don't really it, know him i mean i i mean i think he's one of those difficult characters to write in the book actually because i mean i think that what i try to do in my book is not do a piece of sort of boring history but actually to bring the whole story to life and put you in the driving seat really take the reader on this this roller coaster ride you know what was it like to leave the planet in in on top of essentially a converted nuclear strategic missile intercontinental ballistic missile which is what this guy did and an incredibly dangerous fight that it was i mean in so many different ways and the sort of the difficulty is in a story like that is you want to really bring the characters to life but you want to do it in a way that is this absolutely fact-based you know conversations are as reported they're not nothing is made up I don't, I don't i mean i verify everything at the end of the book so it's very important i was trained as an historian originally to to make sure that i that i do that but um gagarin is a tough nut to crack he's a really i mean the people around him are kind of very vivid and and flawed and three-dimensional gagarin is difficult he's a difficult character to get, and that's kind of what makes him fascinating he's sphinx-like he is this he is this sort of somewhat impenetrable and rather extraordinary person who has a massive impact on people around him and ultimately on the world and yet how do you how do you find the inner man how do you place him how do you how do you draw him in a way that will leap off the page and that was a really interesting challenge a very exciting if you like creative challenge for me to face as i was writing the book which comes across really well the the sort of aspects of him that you see is there's there's an underlying you get this idea of his personality and he does seem to be a very uh, amenable sort of bloke but you know his you know as as, as you go into great detail but and just again listeners we're not going to be talking about the book in its entirety we want you to buy it <laughs> <laughs> Link, links in the description below let, let, let's get straight to it because i am a fan and i want to be able to talk to more people about it without giving away all the good bits but um exactly as you said the way you frame him with these sort of all these different viewpoints of people mm. coming towards him but then also that paternal relationship with uh, the the great designer the court coil of as well mm. the, yeah Ko- Ko- i see i'm gonna this it's is hard to pronounce korolyov korolyov as far as i'm aware i mean my russian research kept correcting me all the way through our trips to russia um and she kept saying so blame her if this is wrong she kept calling him korolyov He's spelled K-O-R-O-L-E-V, but K-O-R-L-Y-O-V is the way I see it in my brain. That's how I pronounce him. Korolyov is a really, really fascinating character. And I think he does really come out in the book. I mean, I hope so. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, I really loved this guy. Um, this is the man that ran the entire Soviet space program. And he was at the same time one of the most secret men in the USSR. And by that, I mean that he was literally that, a secret, he was a state secret. He was, his name was not released to the world at all. Um, He was protected wherever he went on travels around the USSR by KGB men in case the CIA attempted to kidnap him. The CIA spent ages trying to guess who the guy was, who was responsible for all these incredible achievements of the Soviet space program at the time. The first satellite with Sputnik, the first animal in space with Laika, the dog, you know, and obviously moving on to Yuri Gagarin, the first human in space and other space spectaculars that were happening at that time. And Korolev is the man. He was also a very, very senior designer of the premier missile, intercontinental ballistic missile that the Soviets had at the time called the R-7. And it was such an advanced missile at the time that by the late 1950s, the Soviets were possessed of a missile which was capable of carrying a bomb several hundred times the power of the Hiroshima bomb a quarter of the way around the world from the USSR to, say, somewhere like New York. And it's precisely because they had such a big missile that they were able to adapt it and essentially achieve Korolev's great, great dream which is to put the first human being in space. So this guy is secret. He is 
uh, extraordinarily dynamic. He is powerful. He can be scary. He can be fantastically generous. He's a brilliant manipulator. He knows exactly how to play Khrushchev, who at the time was the Soviet premier, and play to Khrushchev's, I mean, amazing insecurities about the West and his desire to prove that really Russia and the Soviets could do anything the West could do, but even better. And they had greater technology and have better this and greater that and all the rest of it. He played to that brilliantly. And he also is this dreamer. He's a man who was, who was, when he was, I think, a little boy, I think I quote this in the book, his mother used to tell him stories about flying in magic carpets around the world. And it's rather beautiful. And I was very moved by that because I think that image, that thought, those stories, if you like, penetrated his soul. And it was because of that that really what happened happened you know that was really part of who he was and he was also interesting because he fell foul of stalin in the late 1930s he was accused completely unjustly of attempting to you know betray the stalinist kind of movement if you like and he was sent to one of the worst gulag camps um in a place called Kolyma, where he was made to dig in mine shafts hundreds of feet underground for gold and very, very nearly died. His jaw was smashed. He was beaten up constantly. He was tortured. He was very lucky not to have been shot. So he was a man who experienced what it is to be on the other side of the regime, to be a victim. And I don't think he ever forgot that. So there's something compellingly human about this guy. Um, and I think he really is a character that I felt my way into and and was a was yeah, a compelling, fascinating, mesmerizingly fascinating man, and the driver behind all of this Soviet success at that period. And in fact, when he died uh, of a, in a botched operation in 1966, I think it was, um, and his identity was first revealed to the world, nobody could, even the New York Times, I mean, nobody realized this is the guy. But when he died in 1966, um, in a way, the Soviet space program died with him. It never got back to that level again. Because they're still using variations on the R7 now, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, the Soyuz rockets that they use to send the Soyuz up in space looks exactly like an R7. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it's modified. It's much more reliable in a lot of different other ways. But essentially, it's the same thing. It has a very distinctive, very, I think, very sort of Russian shape. These great big booster rockets, that are which is a very brilliant, actually, design idea. One that the Americans, well, in a sense, you could argue, adopted with the space shuttle slightly. But but actually, you know, the idea of solid booster rockets, in this case, in their case, these were not solid booster rockets, in the case of the R7. But that is one, one kind of, I suppose, one, one heritage that you get. But essentially, American rockets do not, well, up until very recently, do not look like Soviet rockets. They just don't. Because that's the first thing I thought when I saw the SLS when they unveiled it was mm -hmm. it was very Russian in its mm -hmm. in its design. Because yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we're recording on the day that don't Iran's... tell NASA that. No. <laughs> 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 What's, what's, what's that great line from um, the right stuff? Our Russian, our, our Germans are better than their Germans. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Quite. Mm. But yeah, we're, we're recording this on the day that or Orion's gone, gone round the moon. So, you know, there's, yeah. there's a little, nice little draw to that. Absolutely. Um, just, just to go back to the, the research on that, because there's one of the things that struck me at the end of the book was Korolev. 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 Mm. I'll get that right by yeah. the end of the show. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Gonna... You're, you're kind of there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, his daughter has a little a little museum to him, which I thought was poignant and and also rather heartbreaking as well. That this this Titan, you know, with with uh, the Gagarins in the the main museums, but yet the man, the great That's designer right. himself, has just this little thing that his his daughter keeps going. I was wondering what. What was Natalia like and, and her passion for her father's legacy? Very strange interview that was. So this is the daughter of this guy who's now, I think, in her, well, when I interviewed her in 2019, I think, or 2020, um, she was in her mid-80s. And she, I think she had a very complicated relationship with her father. I mean, it's, I mean, he worked and 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 he worked. That's the first thing. And the other thing is, is that um, when he came out of Colima, and all of the camps and eventually became sort of rehabilitated in the 1940s. He divorced uh, Natalia's mother and um, 
I mean, it was awful, really, because she had st stood by him all the way through this terrible period. But, you know, they had just grown apart. And he ended up marrying his secretary, um, or his translator, in fact, who became his second wife. And that was a very successful marriage. It was a really, really good marriage. But I think it created tremendous strains. And at one point, the daughter was not allowed to see her father if ever he was with his new wife. You know, it was one of those kind of complicated marital situations. Mm. So she never got much time with him as a daughter, but she adored him and she admired him so much. And yet she was also sworn to secrecy, just like he was the state secret. She was not allowed to tell anybody that this was the guy. So every time there was some incredible success, she would know about it. She was told about it. This was what her dad was doing, but she wasn't allowed to tell anybody else. It's a very poignant moment. After Yuri Gagarin went into space, there was this probably the biggest party in Russian and and Moscow's history, apart from possibly the celebrations at the end of the Second World War, that took place to celebrate Yuri Gagarin's fight. It was a huge deal. Millions of people. I've got masses of footage of this stuff, which I use for that taste that we talked about. They had cameras everywhere. And it's not set up. It's not a it's not a it's not a processed occasion. It, it, it's very genuinely spontaneous. You can see that. And it's it was an incredible outpouring of excitement at this moment for all sorts of different reasons. And and at the center of it was Khrushchev himself, the leader of the Soviet Union, and of course the hero Yuri Gagarin. And the one man who gets lost in all of this is Korolev. I mean, without him, this wouldn't have happened. I mean, no way would any of this have happened. But he is, he can't even get to the actual ceremony itself in Red Square because his car kind of gets stopped on the way. There's too much traffic and he ends up watching it at home on television. And then later on that evening, there is this huge kind of event that takes place in the Grand Ballroom in the Kremlin Palace. And everybody's honoring Yuri Gagarin and this and that. And there's everybody you can think of. And it's an incredibly grand event onto the chandeliers and this incredibly beautiful building. And nobody knows who this guy is. This guy is just no one. He's Mr. Nobody. You know, he's, he's just, he is not the person anybody notices. And yet without him, it would never have happened. So he lives a life in the shadows. And I think for the daughter, that was difficult. And so the, sh the, apart the little apartment that sh she has in Moscow, is her monument to him. I'm not saying that he isn't actually memorialized elsewhere. There are statues here and there around you. I mean, he is now a well-known, a reasonably well-known figure, but there it's really very moving. She's got little details, a little bit. She's got, you know, the mug in which, he, the little tin mug, I think it was, or aluminum mug, which he had with him in Colima in this camp with his initials scratched into the surface, you know, um, little details like that that she has kept and the walls are filled with photographs and little models of the kind of the spaceships that he had sort of made or in, had led the inventors and the designers and the engineers to build these things. I mean, it's really moving. Um, and it's also moving because she's so old herself now and she's sort of looked after by her own daughters and, and, and God knows what's going to happen with this stuff when she's, when she's dead. So it was a great privilege, really, to meet somebody like that and to talk about her father, who I think is really rather a great man. We were chatting before about about the right stuff and how he's, mm. he's the man behind the curtain. And un, until I read your book, there was so much about him that I didn't I didn't know. I'd, I'd assumed he'd have been caught up in in Stalin's moments of 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 madness because everybody mm. was but to that degree but also you know the, the the aspect of the mug as well that he held on to that for all mm. of that time you would have mm. you know you would have thought i'm out now let's, let's let's move on but he sort of clung to that and i guess that was one of the things that must have driven him to keep that that level of work up yeah he never he never wore gold either i mean having dug for gold as a prisoner in the gulag in siberia through the winter and, and so many people died. I mean, millions died in the gulags over the time. And he never, he never wore gold the rest of his life. Never. And so there were little these things that there was a kind of a, an, how should I put it? There was a kind of a, there was an honesty in there. In a sense. There was a kind of a recognition of what that past means and you cannot let that go. But there was also an understanding, and I write about this in the book. There was also an understanding that the system that did that once to you could do it again. Mm. Be careful. You know, he had to play the system and he had to play it carefully and he came very close to the wire on a few occasions you know because he was difficult and he was challenging and there was one occasion when he was beginning to really challenge 
Khrushchev himself. He became a little bit too powerful for his own good. And Khrushchev did not like it. You know, don't forget who you're addressing. Don't forget who you're talking to. I am the leader of the Soviet Union. You know, and he could have fallen foul and out of favor if he hadn't been careful, but he managed to kind of hold on to his position. So he was also a an arch manipulator in a way. And had he not been, there's absolutely no way that he could have achieved what he achieved. And it, it's those similarities with Werner von Braun as well, the the, the showmanship, the, the ability to, to mm. play people, to play the room, um, makes the two sides of the space race so, so fascinating. Because it's one of the things you do in the book is you sort of, have have the mercury seven going alongside but you sort of use them as our entry point into a slightly different world that we don't really understand the the complexities of the soviet system and I, that i thought was was really was really a, a, a good, yeah. good way of doing it yeah i mean i think thank not, you not, I think not to not not to blow smoke at you as well but i just thought no 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 i mean i think it's it's, it's very sorry it's very kind of you to say that i mean look the, the story is about duels duels you know it's like the best dramas, it's a competition. This is a race, okay? It's a race which is more than just a great technological race. It is a race between the two superpowers in the aftermath of the Second World War, at the height of the Cold War, at a very dangerous time in history, in many ways reminiscent to this time we're living in now, has many echoes with that time, which would be obvious to readers, without spelling things out, obviously, because that would be a bit banal. It's obvious that there are connections. Obviously, there are differences too. But you get these two nations. And to put the first human being into space, the competition between them for that arena to conquer the unknown effectively becomes the race of races. It becomes the battle of battles. If you fight an actual battle, you're going to end up with World War Three, and you're going to devastate the planet. There were already thousands of nuclear weapons by then, you know, just sitting there waiting to be used. So how do you fight it? You fight it in a different arena. Essentially, you fight it peacefully, which is what the space race was supposed to be about, at least. And you have your teams of gladiators on both sides competing. And the, the real power about this is that this is the duel that's taking place. One team. I mean, it is like the movie Gladiator. You've got one team and you've got another team and they are pitted against each other. And what makes it particularly exciting for me is that one team, the American team, is out there, is in the open, is celebrated. These are guys that become, you know, rock stars, superheroes before they ever set foot in space from the moment they're first announced in 1959. I'm talking about the Mercury 7, America's first seven astronauts in waiting. And on the other side, you get 20 cosmonauts who are selected directly as a response to the American team, who are selected and subsequently trained for the same event to get a human being into space first, and done so in total and absolute secrecy. One open, one secret, pitted against each other. That's the duel. And what makes it so amazing is that in some ways it's not too absurd to say and maybe some people regard it as being so but i don't think so in the context of the geopolitical landscape of the time who was to win that race was terribly important you've got battle zones potentially all over the world in which there's one ideology communism versus another ideology which you would call democratic capitalism or anything you like you've got vietnam about to flare up you've got cuba happening you've got the berlin wall just about to be built this is a dangerous world and so who wins that race who gets to be top dog who gets to show the world we have the know-how we have the technology we have missiles which are big enough to carry humans into space we are ahead could tip the balance and so although for us, looking back, we know what happened. We know the Cold War, that Cold War ended. We know the Berlin Wall came down in 1989 and so on. When you're, I've got an ant's eye view of history. They don't know it's happening. They don't know this is coming. They don't know what's coming. They're just swimming with their head above water, just. And that's what makes it so exciting. If you can go back into that, then it starts to, to work. And so my narrative is is very concentrated period of time, just a few months, in which we we go backwards and forwards between different elements on both sides as this race kind of narrows down, it tunnels down to that one incredible moment when a human being finally, on this very dangerous mission, left our planet. 
and went into space. Dear listener, we're, we're not going to be delving into too many of the specifics of it, because again, we want you to buy the book. Um, well, there's sometimes I can't help getting into space. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> but I, I, it's just a straight but, subject. That's a good thing. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, we, there's, there, there, honestly, there's talking about just, you know, say, you know, uh, Gagarin's flight, Shepard's flight, which of course we mm. need to bring out, was, was not orbital. He was essentially a, a cannonball. Sorry, Al. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello, folks. I'm Zach White, chair of the Napoleonic and Revolutionary War Graves charity. We're a new organization that honors the veterans of the period 1775 to 1815. What many don't realize is that those who died in conflicts before 1900 are not covered by war graves commissions, meaning that many veterans' graves are lying in disrepair. But the problem is more serious than that, because plenty of veterans' bodies are being excavated but nobody is burying them. Instead, these war heroes' bodies are lying in cardboard boxes, their sacrifice forgotten. At the NRWGC, we're changing that, restoring graves and giving these veterans the dignity of a proper burial. So if you feel that the war dead deserve this basic respect, take a look at our website, www.nrwgc.com, to find out more about our aims how you can donate, and the perks of being a member. Thank you. But I just want to jump back to the animals a second, because you, you've got, you know, because they don't know what's going to happen when somebody goes mm. up that high. The, the, mm. the, again, it's, it's sort of the, that sound barrier effect, isn't it? That, you know, mm. you'll, you'll Absolutely. Or something mm. gets up. So the, the Russians have, they, they're, they're sending up dogs who generally don't come back, in, in the case of Hoylaika, who, who o overheated. But the, one mm. of the things that jumped out at me is... Ham, which was one of the, the, the first chimp chimpanzee that the Americans sent into space, the images of him as part of the narrative of the space program are, you know, are, are probably as famous as many of the astronauts themselves, um, mm. especially after the first couple. But there's a little line in, in the end of your chapter about Ham, which was, which was Jane Goodall um, saying that the picture of Ham that was on the paper saying the happiest monkey in space and all that she mm. said it was the most extreme fear i've ever seen on any chimpanzee mm. and no, well, that... i mean she yeah yeah i mean look she i mean i mean and she's the world expert on chimpanzees so she would know i mean ham was sent up on january the 31st 1961 and he was sent up on a redstone missile which is a missile designed by Werner von Braun, who's sort of Korolev's evil twin if you like and again another <laughs> fascinating and very flawed character ex ss man who is now working for the americans and he later went on to build the saturn V. he his rocket carried this first chimpanzee into space on the exactly the same mission as the one in which the first american astronaut was expected to fly the astronaut that was ultimately alan shepherd as you say and a hell of a lot rides on this. In fact, my book kind of is really starting in that period in January 61. As I said, it's a very concentrated time period. It takes place over four or five months, which I think is more exciting anyway as a narrative. And the reality is that everything hinged on that flight. You know, if it all went wrong, what was going to happen? Were they going to send an astronaut at all? Were they going to send one later? I mean, what was going to happen? Because there was a real fear that if something went wrong, given the fact that... America, unlike the Soviet Union, everything was going to be on television. Everything was going to be broadcast live. This moment was going to be broadcast live. And by that point, most Americans had TV sets. What you were looking at was the possibility of a spectacular own goal, if anything went wrong, right there on color TV. And it was color for many people back then. In And live, you know, I mean, it would be a disaster. I think somebody once said it would be the most expensive public funeral in history. And it would have been. So Ham's flight was crucial and Ham was trained. He was kidnapped from Africa by trappers and sold to NASA for under $500. And he was then made to join a colony of other chimpanzees in a place called the Holloman Era Medical Laboratory. And they were then essentially trained, um, to endure what would be a space flight 
and all the things that would happen in a space flight. And the training took place over months, if not years. This colony of chimpanzees um, was trained, first of all, to be able to be restrained in very, very small spaces without complaint. Um, they were tied to chairs each day for ever longer periods. They were also trained uh, to ex sort of experience the unbelievably high Gs uh, acceleration forces that you would experience uh, in any kind of rocket flight, particularly on launch and also on re-entry. Um, and you're talking about the, essentially what I mean by that is that you weigh much, much more than you normally would if, depending on the size of those acceleration forces, sometimes up to 10 or 15 times your normal weight. And so you have to know how to withstand that. You have to be trained. As they go on these incredible centrifuge rides, just as the real astronauts, I say the real, I mean the human astronauts would have had to do or did do. And they also were trained to do something which um, is just, I mean, it's just a beggar's belief when you think about it. They were trained on a machine called a psychomotor. And a psychomotor is a machine. It, there were various versions of it, but essentially what it is, is a couple of levers and some lights. I think one was blue and one was white, these lights. And you essentially, the chimpanzee was trained to pull the lever when certain lights flashed in a particular way. If a blue light flashed, they had a certain amount of time which to react to it by pulling one of the levers and ditto when the white light went. If they got it wrong, they were electrocuted on the soles of their feet. So these chimpanzees learned pretty quickly to get it right. And they practiced on the psychomotor for hundreds of hours on the ground. And the best psychomotor ace, the guy that was better than anybody else, was the chimpanzee that was later called Ham. He wasn't actually called Ham to begin with. He had various other names, but we'll call him Ham for now because that's what he became. And Ham was the best at this. So the flight that took place on January the 31st, 1961, had Ham sitting in one of these little container, little pressurized container at the top of the Redstone rocket, about to be blasted on the same profile as the flight that the human astronaut would do. And with his psychomotor, with his two handles right by his head, which he was going to have to start pulling in a certain sequence so that he would not only experience all the rigors of a space flight, much of which nobody knew much about, but unlike the human astronaut, unlike Alan Shepard, he was also potentially, if he got it wrong, going to be electrocuted on the soles of his feet. So it was a, and the flight went wrong. It was presented as a success, but in ways that I describe in the book, so I won't go into all the detail here, it went wrong. It really did go wrong. And it, and it would have been a hell of a terrifying ride for Hab. Awful, absolutely awful. He landed hundreds of miles off course, and the end of the flight, his 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 capsule, his Mercury capsule, very nearly sank into the Atlantic Ocean. He was fished out literally at the last moment. And, you know, for all his efforts, he got an apple. And that photograph of the chimpanzee smiling with the apple is the one that you referred to that was like the happy space chimp. Isn't he amazing? The chimpanaut, he was called, you know? Um, and those pictures went all over the world. But what? as you rightly said, Jane Goodall said when she saw those pictures, is, is what we're looking at is, is, is the most extreme terror in any chimpanzee I've ever seen. And it's not surprising. So in that flight, I take you. I take you on that ride. I don't do it from just the ground upwards. And I met many of the people who were involved in that flight at different levels, who I quote in the book. And I, I build a, you know, a, a real picture of that, the tension. Um, but I put you in that capsule as best as I possibly can. Of course, one never can do that. But as best as I can with Ham on that incredible and also terrifying. I think it was a 16 minute flight. That's all it was up into space and then down again, 16 minutes. And it was 16 minutes of nightmare really for this animal. And it was because of that, that the Americans got into a dither about whether to put another human being up or an human being up, I should say next. And this dither, is precisely what Korolev, who could see it happening because, you know, open press and everything like that, he could see there was dither. It and was he, live on telly. It was live on telly. And he just went in that gap. He had a narrow window and he realized that however dangerous it was, however much risk there was, however many systems had not been properly tested, he had one opportunity to get this right and all wrong, as the case may be. And he grabbed it with both arms and that's the drama he went he had a window of about two weeks and he went for it 
and it's yeah just just to remind people the redstone that they sent ham on was infamous for doing the four inch flight wasn't it so this was not mm -hmm. a, a tried and tried mm -hmm. and tested tried and tested rocket well it was, I, a, it, was a, it was a it was a medium range tactical missile you know with a tactical nuclear missile effectively a tactical nuclear missile or didn't have to have a nuclear warhead on the back of it but it was on the top of it um but yeah you're absolutely right there'd been a flight a, a test flight without anything on it uh, which had managed to get four inches into the air <laughs> and it came crashing back again in front of the world's press and it was known as the four inch flight you know and this was not much before the one we're talking about you know i mean these things these these rockets kept blowing up you know, they blew up in every single possible way. I interviewed one guy who's sadly now passed away, who was one of the guys, um, one of the American engineers who was actually in the control room, the launch control room, essentially, which is very quite close to the pad. And one of these things took off and it did a U-turn. It came straight to the pad, you know, and I talk about it in, in the book. I mean, they were dangerous, these missiles. They blew up in all kinds of ways. I think somebody, I went to a museum in America and somebody had compiled a, a, a sequence to music of all these missiles that are going to blow up. And it's just like, did, it, did any of them work? <laughs> After the X1 bit in the Right Stuff movie, I think that that section of all the rockets exploding is is my favorite because oh yes they have it in there too yeah. you're quite right i've forgotten that that's absolutely right the russians don't forget the soviets i should say soviets really the soviets did uh have loads themselves loads of their rocket the r7 was notorious at blowing up but the difference is they didn't broadcast it there is an enormous advantage as i'm sure putin has discovered himself to a certain extent in covering up the truth but when the truth comes out, it comes back to hit you that much harder, as I'm sure he's also discovering. Very much so. Yeah. Right. We're we're not gonna we're not gonna go into Gagarin because there's another chap we want to talk about who's who's a, remarkable in his own way because he was not in the original group of the Vanguard Six, and it's another Russian name I'm probably gonna completely murder. But we're gonna go for uh, Grigory <laughs> Nabolov. Nabolov. Nelubov. Nelubov, ah, oh, there you go. But he, he's, he's fascinating because he Nelubov he, actually, I think. But yeah, Nelubov. Okay, I think so. I think so. I, I think so. But uh, go, go, you'll have some Russian listeners who'll say, "Oh no, that's not right." Russian speaking listeners. Yeah. Nelubov. Please put, I think. Yeah, dear listener, please put the phonetics in the comments mm. below <laughs> to help. But he he's only there because his predecessor is injured or killed in the centrifuge beforehand and and he's called up as a replacement. um yeah 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 so what happened with him so the van you mentioned the vanguard six just to sort of so the audience can understand what's going mm -hmm. on basically the the vanguard six is the name of the six cosmonaut team remember i mentioned the gladiators that was essentially put together in direct response to the mercury seven except of course they weren't known as the vanguard six to the world mm -hmm. And some say they weren't really known to the Vanguard Six themselves, but essentially that's what they were. They were the Vanguard. They were the, there were 20 cosmonauts that were selected. The Vanguard Six were the six front runners, the ones that were going to go first for a variety of disputed reasons, which we don't need to go into. Those six were chosen. Gagarin, Yuri Gagarin was one of those people. Nelubov was not one of those people to begin with. One that had been there had injured himself very badly on one of those centrifuge rides i talked about with those acceleration forces and basically part of his back had blown off um and it was horrific what happened they pushed him too hard he had some kind of i don't know there was something that went wrong and and effectively he he was removed from the program completely and nelubov stepped into his place stepped into his shoes and he was a very interesting guy he was um one of the very few test pilots in the first 20 cosmonauts and indeed the six vanguard cosmonauts that were the front runners in that 20. unlike the americans every one of which was a test pilot all the mercury seven they had, that was part of the qualification criteria they had to be military test pilots they all were but this guy was was they weren't test pilots but this guy had flown what was then one of the Soviet Union's kind of really kind of high tech aircraft that could get faster than the speed of sound, could go supersonic, uh, the MiG 19 fighter jet. He had flown that. He was a very, very good pilot. He was a very clever man. And there was a period when the question of who was going to be the first, who was going to be chosen as the first Russian or other Soviet cosmonaut came down to three. Yuri Gagarin was one of them. Another man called Geman Titov was the second one that was considered. And the third, all from this Vanguard Six, was this guy, Grigory Nilyubov. And it was really touch and go 
right up into the last few weeks, which of these was going to step into the history books as the first one to be in space. And Nelyubov, although he had tremendous drive and was clever and was efficient and all of that, he had weaknesses too, which were being picked up by his instructors. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed writing about in the book was that I had access to a secret diary. It was secret then, it's been published since, written by the chief of cosmonaut training at the time, a man called Nikolai Kamanin, who kept a secret diary. It's incredible, this general kept a secret diary, which would have landed him in a, quite possibly in a camp himself had he been discovered. It was essentially a criminal act. And he wrote this diary up. So you do have a kind of, to use a documentary term, fly on the wall thing in the book where you're right in the center of events at these secret meetings where all kinds of decisions are happening. So he writes about these three men, Gagarin, Titov, and Nelyubov. And he talks about Nelyubov's effectiveness, but also about this weakness, which was he was he was arrogant, very, and he was self-centered, very, and he was kind of narcissistic, very. And that was a problem, you know, so, because so, uh, it, sorry, test, yes, yeah, go so he was a test pilot. He, yeah, he was a test pilot. He's got to be all those things. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But he was, but the thing is, if you think about it, what is it you need for this guy? What you need is not just somebody who has certain requisite, certain skills. I mean, they've got to be decent pilots. They've got to be able to endure a hell of a lot. They've got to be very fit because nobody quite knows what's going to happen up there to them. They've got to be brave, obviously. Um, if they're successful and there's a very high chance that they're not going to be, I think the, the, there's actually somebody who calculated the chances um, and the chances of coming through the first ride into space, the one that Gagarin took alive were less than 50, 50. Okay. So imagine going under the knife in an operation, being told by your surgeon, you've got less than 50% chance of coming out of this alive. So, so, or you might be brutally mutilated, you know, something horrible. That's kind of the, that's what was happening when you stepped onto that rocket, essentially. Um, God knows they all wanted to do it. But the fact is that Nelyubov, he would, like any of these people who were first, have to be the Soviet post boy. His job was to go and sell Soviet ideology, to show the world that this was top nation, that this was the way the future lay. You know, don't go America, go Russia, go Soviet. That's the future. Here's the proof. Look at this young man, smiling, successful, charming, charismatic, all of that. Was Nelibov the right man for that job? Anyway, at the very last moment, he was pulled from first place. But he never got into space at all, even though he was in the team. He was back up for various different cosmonauts. And then in 1963, he got into an argument at a railway station near an airbase outside Moscow, where he was basically drunk or a possibly drunk. He was with two other, it's quite uncertain exactly what happened, but the bottom line is he was with two other cosmonauts. They got into an argument with the military police. The military police were appalled by their behavior. They demanded an apology and Nelyubov refused to apologize. He was asked again and again to apologize. This is the narcissist. He refused to apologize as a result of which he was expelled from the cosmonaut training program, which remember was essentially, it was a secret training program. And he was completely airbrushed out of history as a result. He was sent off to fly jets somewhere in the far eastern section of Russia. Um, he got more and more depressed. Um, he wasn't allowed to tell any of his comrades who he was, where he'd been, what he'd done. I think he tried to and believe him. Um, in subsequent photographs that were released later in the 1960s of the Vanguard Six and of other cosmonauts, his image was completely erased. It was literally airbrushed out, like photoshopped out, it didn't exist. And in 1966, now an alcoholic living in this kind of godforsaken part of Russia, he, his wife was so frightened about him because he was so drunk all the time, locked him into her apartment, into their apartment and went to work. He somehow got out of the apartment and either because he was possibly drunk, fell onto some train line or threw himself in front of a train and was killed. And for many, many years, his grave did not carry any information about the fact that he was a cosmonaut. So he was a man, but eventually, many, many years later, at the end of the 1980s, we're talking about, the story finally came out about who this guy was. But the interesting thing about it too, I mean, you know, he brought it upon himself and all the rest of it, you could argue. What's interesting 
about it is that there's a lot of conspiracy theories about lost cosmonauts and about cosmonauts who went up into space before Yuri Gagarin and they died. And, and, and it's actually all this kind of stuff. There are other stories as well, a bit like this, that feeds into those conspiracy theories because, because there were so many lies in a society, which is all about lying and about concealing truths. What happens is you, you, that is the fuel that feeds conspiracy theories effectively. And Nellie Bob's erasure, literal erasure, you know, literally erased out of history, I think fueled the idea or helped amongst other things to fuel the idea that there was another cosmonaut and something happened to that cosmonaut and that cosmonaut died and nobody admitted it, you know? So it, it's, it's kind of interesting, both for a, kind of a pathetic story in itself, but it's also interesting in what it says about the mentality of the society uh, in which he lives or lived. I, I, that was going to be my wrapping up question, really, was the, the last communist co cosmonaut thing. Is, mm. It's that tie of people seeing something like this and then just exploding it out into... Well, uh, it's, 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 I mean, I can say, just to build that just for a minute, because it is totally fascinating. There are two other things that happened. I would talk about this in the world. Um, because there were all kinds of rumors at the time, you know, and they, they at the time there were rumors. So a time before Yuri Gagarin, and this thing just doesn't die. I mean, you go on Google and it goes on and on. There, let me just say for the record, there were no lost cosmonauts before Yuri Gagarin. Okay, they just weren't. You know, men did go to the moon, right? I mean, these things happened. Okay, and it's it's it's. I spent so much time on this story. Um, but I can also understand how these rumours came up. I mean, we've talked about Nelyubov. There was a dummy that was being used on two flights before Yuri Gagarin, who had the name, like John Smith, we'd say, you know, Ivan Ivanovich. I describe him in some detail. And Ivan Ivanovich went on two proving flights in 1961, a month before Yuri Gagarin flew. This is March 1961 on two flights as they were accelerating the Russians to get Korolev to get ahead of the Americans. And they did these two flights with about two or three weeks in between them. And the guy had a tape recorder. I said the guy, even I'm calling him the guy, he was actually a dummy. And he had a tape recorder um, installed in his stomach area, effectively, that was essentially broadcasting all sorts of things like recipes for chicken soup and and <laughs> and and the Pietnitsky choir singing songs and all this being picked up on the ground by receiving stations at the CIA and what was up there, you know? Um, there was a man called Valentin Bondarenko um, who had to suffer one of the most difficult parts of the training that the Russian Soviets had, the Soviet uh, cosmonauts had, unlike the Americans, which was this thing called the Chamber of Silence, where they were made to experience what it was like to be in a sealed chamber, a pressure sealed chamber, uh, for up to maybe two weeks at a time with no human voices to speak to, no contact with the outside world at all, to see if they could survive the isolation of space if something went wrong and they were left up there to orbit the Earth for two or three weeks entirely on their own without going insane. And so they went into this chamber of silence. They were sealed in there and left. And it was horrific. I've actually seen the chamber of silence. Uh, I've been in that very chamber. And just being in there with the door open, these massive doors, like submarine doors with great wheels. So it's really frightening. And, and occasionally people would peep through a port, a kind of one-way porthole. It was really awful. And sounds would be piped in from time to time to wake you up in the middle of the night. But you didn't know when it was day or night because all of that was kept from you as well. Anyway, there was one guy, this young, I think the youngest of the cosmonaut group called Valentin Bondrenko. He went in there and I think on the 10th day, he was cooking some soup. He had a hot plate, electric hot plate on. He had uh, a little kind of um, a piece of cotton wool that was soaked in alcohol that he was using uh, to wipe the residue from one of his sensors that he had, uh, you know, to measure heartbeat or whatever. On his skin, he pulled it off and he tossed it behind his shoulder and it landed, the, the alcohol fueled, alcohol soaked cotton wool tab landed on the hot plate. And the whole thing went on fire because it's an oxygen rich environment in this barometrically pressure sealed kind of unit chamber and he burned to death. Again, this happened just three weeks before Yuri Gagarin flew. And so again, people saw this burned person in a hospital in Moscow and 
nurses and doctors would have seen this and it was obviously an enormous amount of secrecy about it i mean there's actually the memoirs of the doctor who tried to treat this guy and he died in the hospital a few hours after this terrible accident these things all come together and they start to generate these conspiracies and these myths about hidden or lost or dying astronauts or cosmonauts who never did die in space before Yuri Gagarin, there were those who did, died later, but never did die in space before Yuri Gagarin. And this, this is how that conspiracy gets generated. That bit was a little bit too vivid for me. I, I don't like con <laughs> confined spaces and being locked, locked in. Can you a, imagine that? Oh, horrible. That's just horrible. Honestly, just honestly, I honestly about just going in there. Chamber is now, I can't remember what it's in a museum somewhere. I think it was in Moscow. I mean, I went to lots of different places. My researcher and I went all over the place in, in Moscow. And it was horrific, actually. It's a really frightening, horrible, horrible experience just to be there for five minutes, let alone two weeks. And you didn't know, you didn't know when you're going to come out. You mm. didn't actually know. They didn't tell you. You could be there for even longer. Some people went completely crazy in there. Yuri Gagarin famously spent the whole time um, dreaming about flying around the world. You know, he was already thinking ahead. Um, one guy called, um, I mean, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, one guy called Pov Povich, another wonderful uh, cosmonaut, actually, I really like, like him. He's dead now. Um, spent the whole, he had a wonderful baritone voice. He was Ukrainian. And he spent the whole time singing Ukrainian folk songs to get him through his two weeks. So some people managed to find a way and others did not. But Bondarenko actually died horribly. And of course, Popov was was up top of the list as well, but he couldn't go because he was Ukrainian. Just to be yeah, Popovich. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he was, I mean, you know, the reality is, is that it was going to be a Russian. You know, whatever happened was going to be Russian. They would, they would pay lip service to the idea this is the U USSR, but the reality is it's going to be Russian. Popovich did go subsequently, um, but he was Ukrainian. And 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 the point about Gagarin was that he was as perfectly Russian as you could possibly get. He really was, and he was also, you know, the son of a of a carpenter. He he had the perfect who'd himself trained. I mean, Gagarin had trained as an iron foundry worker, so he was he was the perfect biography for a Soviet cosmonaut, an iron foundry peasant, son of a carpenter, who ends up being the first Soviet and indeed the first human to leave our planet and go into space. Couldn't be better. And, and Khrushchev used it for everything he had. Stephen, this has been an absolute delight. I can't recommend the book highly enough. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I dive back into it from time to time just to, to pick out my bits because I'm, I'm fascinated by this this period and things so thank you so much for spending the last hour with us thank you very much i enjoyed it it's great thanks a lot i have to thank stephen walker once again for joining me here on the damcasters as i said in the intro beyond i read in almost a sitting it is fascinating it captures you and the stories of the soviet space program are remarkable not for the myths of the lost cosmonauts but for the bonds that were built the men that were there and the chief designer at the top of it. I can't recommend this book highly enough. And I said a couple times in the podcast, go out and buy it. Well, it's that time of year to be buying books and it is out now in paperback. So in the description below, there's a link to Amazon where the book is available in paperback and to our Boney Abroad Pods bookshop where it's available in hardback. Please give it a go. You won't regret it. And who knows, maybe if the book continues to sell as well as it has, we might get that documentary. Of course, wrapping up the podcast, we have to do this bit. If you're able to support the pod in any way, that would be great. I've been humbled by the amount of people that have been tuning in so far. So thank you so much for that. And the support can come as simple as just giving the podcast a review on your podcast app of choice. Stick some stars in. Let me know how we're going. There's the Patreon page, of course, if you want to support the pod that way, which starts just from three quid a month with a spot of VAT on the top. But if you can just tell your friends, if you're enjoying this, of course, tell everyone. Don't have to be your friends. Just let them know because I'm enjoying doing this. I'm enjoying interacting with everybody who's been listening. And I can't wait to share with you what we have coming up next. I did tease that we're going to be talking about the future of aviation. That is happening next week. It's going to be a two-parter with Joe Welding. Please do join us for that. As always, thank you so much for your support and do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone.
and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.